And there's a very good chance that the big secret that Pete Buttigieg is trying to hide is that he participated in this horrendous failure and he doesn't want his name and his reputation as a, as a problem solver attached to what was the largest clusterfuck in American foreign policy history. My guess is, is at the end of all this, Pete Buttigieg realized he was part of this mess. It started under Bush. It continued under Obama. It was, the, 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 the inability to fix anything in Iraq was absolutely a seamless transition between the two uh, administrations. There was no, no real change. The only thing that changed was which group was doing it. I mean, if you can imagine this reconstruction process as a series of archaeological layers, um, you know, at the if you dig down deep enough, Paul Bremer had this idea that a bunch of young kids from the Heritage Foundation and 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 whatever, you know, Republican Party interns were going to uh, to privatize Iraq over a, over a long weekend. And when that failed, there was the, the next layer above that were these uh, private uh, contracting companies. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? moderate rebels all right welcome to moderate rebels i'm here in the moderate rebels uh safe house with ben norton and we are about to announce our final mission uh before we disappear off the face of the earth uh we are going to read prepared statements into this camera in this dark secret location it's actually the same safe house pete Buttigieg was in in iraq um, actually, that's the topic of our show. Uh, we won't be embarking on a final mission. Hopefully, we'll have future episodes. Uh, we will be talking about Pete Buttigieg and his secret mission in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has signed a non-disclosure agreement, or is at least citing a non-disclosure agreement, to not talk about his work uh, with McKinsey, the um, multinational consulting firm uh, which has done work everywhere from um, the Gaza Strip and uh, to uh, China to Saudi Arabia, and was heavily involved in a very uh, scandalous boondoggle in Iraq, where Pete Buttigieg was stationed. And you know, Pete Buttigieg is currently running his version of John McCain's Straight Talk Express, where he's accompanied by. You know the, the the press corps in Iowa and New Hampshire out on the primaries, and he's being as accessible as possible and opening up about his life. And he refuses to talk about this episode for some reason. Uh, some have speculated it's because he was actually involved with U.S. intelligence with the CIA, um, but there may be other reasons. Uh, we have a really special guest um, to discuss what actually went down in Iraq and how the U.S. wasted billions and billions of dollars uh, embarking on what was a, actually a criminal occupation, um, trying to dress it up as this benevolent, altruistic, carrying the white man's burden operation uh, to uplift the Iraqi people, in which Pete Buttigieg apparently was heavily involved. And he refers to actually having been in an Iraqi safe house, a so-called safe house, in his autobiography. So... Um, to talk about Mayor Pete and discuss the boondoggle in Iraq, the U.S. boondoggle, we have uh, Peter Van Buren. Peter Van Buren is a 24-year veteran of the State Department. He was a career foreign service officer, and he did two uh, provincial reconstruction team missions in Iraq, which became fodder for his excellent book, We Meant Well, um, it's called We Went Well, How I Helped Lose the Battle for the Hearts and the Minds of the Iraqi People. Um, it's really a, a, it's a very dark and disturbing book. It's also really funny and sardonic. Um, and Peter apparently was so funny and sardonic that he got kicked off Twitter. So we want to talk to him about that as well, because we're both preparing for that experience. <laughs> um, you know, I'll be... You know, if I'm kicked off Twitter, I basically disappear from humanity. Same with Ben. Uh, ben just like goes up into the ether. Um, 
Peter, uh, welcome to Moderate Rebels. Uh, good to have you on. Um, you know, what, what? first of all, b- before we get into your experience in Iraq, and you also have a, 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 a novel which is worth reading called Hooper's War, which came out in 2017 about the moral injury uh, U.S. soldiers experienced um, in the Pacific. But I want to talk to you about your experience in Iraq um, and, you know, putting it in the context of Booty Judge's uh, kind of reticence about his own experience. Uh, What do you make of his refusal to discuss his work with McKinsey? What was McKinsey doing there and, uh, you know, how do you think he's going to handle this? Well, first of all, you guys promised that once I did this interview, you're going to unchain me from the basement in the safe house. So that deal is still, <laughs> exactly. still good. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to check check on that because um, it's dark down here. But only after only if the interview is good. If you OK. Don't all right. A little pressure, then. little pressure there. Another but week um, of chains. good, good. Well, some of it's fun. Um, I, I'm glad to say I, I don't know Pete, Pete Booty Judge. I, I don't uh, I didn't meet him um, and I didn't work with him in any capacity in, in Iraq, um, and and that's okay. McKinsey and it, which for if your listeners are not familiar is a massive consulting firm that does a great bulk of its work for the U.S. government. Now, consulting can cover basically anything the U.S. government needs or wants done, and consultants are often called in when there's a problem that the bureaucrats don't want to put their name on or where they want the supposed outside neutral outsiders to endorse an idea, but the bureaucrats don't want to do it themselves. They want to say, well, look, uh, this big consulting company has suggested we do X, Y, and Z. Um, It seems like a great thing and they're neutral, so let's go ahead. Um, McKinsey is very much part of what people talk about when they talk about the in, the uh, military industrial corporate complex they are a big part of all that and so to ask what mckinsey was doing in iraq and afghanistan the answer would be a little bit of everything um and some of the work they did i'm sure uh is classified some of it less so they work for all parts of the U.S. government and have in the past worked for uh, the, the intelligence uh, community and have done classified work for the rest of the government. They've done stuff as benign, for example, as work. look at the uh, State Department personnel system. I remember uh, dealing with them completely independent of Booty Judge and all this. So the answer of what Booty Judge was doing with McKinsey in Iraq is uh, an answer that I think we all need to know the answer to, because simply saying he did it tells us nothing. And for a guy who wants to be president of the United States, and for a guy who openly cites his both his extremely limited military experience in Afghanistan and cites his experience, quote, in government, unquote, uh, connected to McKinsey, I think what he was doing in Iraq and Afghanistan in detail is a very legitimate topic for discussion. And it's it's of some concern to me as a voter, as, as a thinking person, that he's not willing to talk about it. Now, his unwillingness is supposedly built around a non-disclosure agreement he signed. Well, let's talk about that. Um, basically, any time one of these large contracting firms deals with the U.S. government, there's all sorts. Everybody signs non-disclosure agreements. Um, it's part of the process of them being able to ask questions and employees give answers, and it's part of the process of, of making sure that uh, someone who works for McKinsey who learns something on the inside, for example, uh, the the government's going to go out and uh, buy up a uh, billion dollars worth of a certain item. Well, they can't walk out there and buy stock based on that information. So these non-disclosure agreements are standard, um, and they cover, uh, they're very general, and they cover a very broad spectrum of everything. To say that means he can't talk about events from, what, 10, 15 years ago um, is a bit of a, of a fudge. Um, in order to to follow his non-disclosure agreement, I don't think there would be anything in there that says I was working on the oil industry in Iraq. Well, let's start with that broadly. You know, let's, let's start as broad as Pete wants to start, but let's start. 
in other words, don't hide behind something as 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 broad as a as a decade old non disclosure standard non disclosure agreement to say that basically if I tell you anything about it, I'll have to kill you or anything uh, dramatic like that. Yeah. So let's talk really quickly about what we do know. Um, of course, I'm not exp- I'm not expecting you to to speculate about things that we don't know, but what we do know. It comes from what Pete Buttigieg himself wrote. And here I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from an interesting article that was recently published in BuzzFeed. You know, I'm not usually going to compliment BuzzFeed, but this is actually an interesting piece. It's called Pete, Buttig- Pete Buttigieg's work at McKinsey is a secret. And in this piece, the, the author went through his book, Shortest Way to Home. And this is a quote here from Buttigieg. He wrote, quote, back to the U.S. in 2007, I landed a job in Chicago at McKinsey and Company, and my classroom was everywhere. A conference room, a serene corporate office, the break room of a retail store, a safe house in Iraq, or an airplane seat, any place that could accommodate me and my laptop, end quote. And then the the reporter went through and said, the book briefly referenced and Booty Judge occasionally mentions works on efforts to promote energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. He went into substantive detail on only one project, grocery pricing for an unidentified client in Canada, but he offered nothing, nothing further on the safe house in Iraq, easily the most tantalizing tidbit in the chapter. And he did not elaborate beyond identifying himself as a, quote, civilian advisor on the war zone economic development he trumpeted while running for straight state treasurer and mayor. McKinsey had U.S. defense contracts in Afghanistan and Iraq under the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations, ABC News reported, though it's not clear Booty Judge was involved. And then, of course, after that, Booty Judge served in Afghanistan as a Navy intelligence officer. So this is what we do know. I'm wondering if you could comment on what some of those operations could potentially be. So we know that Booty Judge was involved in some kind of economic capacity and working in an Iraq safe house. And I believe I've read elsewhere that he was actually also in the green zone. So what exactly was going on at this time period? And when he says economic advising, what exactly could that mean? Sure. First of all, absent the little little tidbit about the Iraqi safe house, I mean, that's a standard McKinsey corporate drone resume. I mean, they do things like figure out the right prices or, or work out personnel issues or determine wage, you know, what, what wages should be paid to ice cutters in Manitoba or things like that. So that, that, that in itself is not particularly. Thing. But the economic uh, business and stability thing does speak to me. Um, basically, McKinsey and other... I, this is what I worked on in, in Iraq uh, as well, but I did it as a State Department employee. And gratefully, there's no non-disclosure agreement, uh, so we can uh, talk about what Pete won't. Um, basically, McKinsey and a whole raft of other consultants and contractors and, and political appointees and what have you were there to provide the intellectual underpinning of the Bush-Obama reconstruction of Iraq program. And basically, it went the, the, the very broadest view of this is we're going to uh, destroy Iraq in the process of getting rid of Saddam Hussein, and then we are going to rebuild Iraq better than uh, we originally found it. And this will create a functioning democracy in the heart of the Middle East that is friendly to American business, friendly to American foreign policy needs, and will serve as a bulkert against Iranian uh, expansion. And one of the uh, ideas that was underlying all that is that we were going to create a a good, uh, God help me, robust economy for Iraq that not only included, uh, you know, energy, oil, but also included a consumer economy, a manufacturing economy, uh, you know, a multi-headed economy that would survive ups and downs in oil prices and put everybody to work. People making money, people with an investment in the in the in the country, uh, and people with jobs aren't likely to become terrorists or work with the Iranians or do bad things. That is the you know view from forty thousand feet. McKinsey provided that intellectual structure that said, "Yeah, there's lots of old books that say this is a good thing," and McKinsey and other consultants like them 
um, then interacted with people like me to help us determine how to spend the U.S. government's money. So, for example, and I'm trying to give you the most benign, neutral version of all this. In fact, it was all a complete scam and, 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 and varied between tragedy and comedy. But the idea would be, for example, I worked in a rural area, and so... There was a, a study, not by McKinsey, but by some other uh, one of these, we called them Beltway Bandits or Beltway Pirates, that said that um, all the farmers were growing dates, uh, you know, like plums, and there weren't going to be enough people to eat all these dates. And so if we could use the dates to create uh, medical alcohol that could be used in hospitals to sterilize things, then the farmers would have a secondary market for their dates. And there's a one day you'll come into your office and there's like a 200 page document on your desk explaining this. And the idea was that I was supposed to then work with my team to find a way to implement this and ignore the realities of life around us. And this is where the tragic comedy thing starts. So we are 100 miles from nowhere. There's no electricity. The roads are, are, are beaten down, potholed, nasty places, hunted over by bounty hunters, terrorists, and, and Al-Qaeda wannabes. There's no trucks. There's no people who know how to drive trucks. There's no anything. The idea of creating factories in this environment and having people without any ed formal education run those factories to produce medicinal alcohol, transport that stuff to the cities where presumably it would be used, is impossible. It's like showing up on, on a desert island, and I don't know if you ever remember the old TV show Gilligan's Island, where they would build these wonderful machines out of bamboo and bits of string. Um, you know, it, it, the idea was it's impossible. It simply cannot be done. In, meanwhile, there's also, of course, a shooting war going on, and a couple of quick internet searches determines that Iraq is buying most of its medicinal alcohol from Turkey at a cost roughly 10% of what we'd have to charge in order to make this work. The whole idea from top to bottom is impossible, stupid, impractical, and this 200-page study, which costs the U.S. government and the taxpayers God knows how much money, is just part of everyone looking the other way. That is kind of the most benign version. If you want to add some, uh, some darkness to it, many times these... Uh, business and stability operations were pre-written for an American company to uh, walk in and, and collect money off of. In other words, they would, uh, over the course of a couple of hundred pages, end up recommending a product or a service, which, funny, turns out to be available only in this way from one particular American company. Um, and if you followed all the recommendations, you inevitably were going to buy these products from company XYZ in the United States. And if you cared to do any research at all, the chances were they were a donor to whichever party was in power, etc. Things like that. Um, sometimes uh, it shifted into more political things. For example, um, under George Bush, there was not really a lot of interest in women's issues in Iraq. When Obama took office, we suddenly had consultants arriving who were working on women's issues. And the Democracy for All initiative that was running last week got repurposed into Women's Democracy Initiative a week later um, because of a new consultant study that said this is the way things are going. So a lot of this was political. A lot of it was aimed at a domestic audience. All of it was bullshit. If, can I say bullshit on your show? You Please. can. You can. We encourage it. And, and so, and so you said that you wrote that basically your job and the job of many of the people um, in your team was just to dole out as much U.S. taxpayer money as possible, just to figure out how to spend this money. It was like, you know, Brewster's Millions meets Rudyard Kipling meets uh, David Petraeus. It was even better than that because there were essentially, A, no limits on how much we could spend, and B, money was the only metric that we were measured against. 
24 years in, in government, and certainly if, if you ask any bureaucrat, the first thing he or she always says is, our budget's not big enough. It doesn't matter if they're working at the, the Pentagon on, on, on space lasers or if they're working at some social service agency where they're trying to feed hungry people. They will always tell you, our budget's not big enough. We need more money. Um, for the first time in, in my life, never mind my government career in Iraq, we had essentially more money than we could spend. I'll say unlimited money because we just couldn't do the paperwork fast enough to, to spend it. And at the same time, since actual success was measured however we wanted to measure it, in other words, nobody measured success by saying um, Iraq is a nicer place or something, um, how much money we spent became the metric, um, both for us, both for the State Department, the civilian side, and for the U.S. military. And so the more money you spent, the happier your bosses were. We, we were per basically, we had, you know, 23% more democracy in my sector because uh, we funded this uh, power plant or whatever it is we spent money on. And so there was kind of a race to spend money um, oftentimes these metrics were imposed on, on like a monthly basis. We need to increase the amount of uh, money we're spending by 19% before the end of the month. Um, the military used a phrase which was adopted by the State Department was money as a weapon system. And they would, because uh, they had to fit it into their own structure, they would conduct both lethal and non-lethal targeting sessions. So the lethal targeting session, of course, is just what it says. Hey, is it, where are we having trouble in the, in the sector? We're going to drop some bombs and, and, and fix that. The, they came to call spending money, <coughs> excuse me, non-lethal targeting. We're going to drop money on this village, and that's going to cause something uh, important to happen. And, and so the idea was that spending money was what we were told to do. And these consultants were, were both. Both our, 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 our helpers and our, our, our pushers, I guess, like a drug dealer. Because when your boss says you've got to find a way to spend 19% more money by the end of the month um, and you don't kind of have something in your back pocket um, or a match just to set fire to the cash and watch it burn, um, these consultant companies would show up um, almost like you dream them into existence and say, good news, Mr. Van Buren, we have identified a uh, uh, greenhouse uh, building project that will uh, run up your budget by 19%. And we've identified someone to do the work and just sign here, please. And quite literally, it was that easy. Just sign here um, became the way to make people happy. Now, if Booty Judge was truly in the green zone, then he was kind of at the upper levels of, of all this. Not necessarily a big shot, but a look, but working on it at that level. Um, I was out in the countryside, uh, the literal boots on the ground, if you will, um, spending the money, interacting with the Iraqis. People who lived and worked in the green zone um, were, were kind of removed from the dust and the dirt. The Green Zone was famously the uh, area in central Baghdad that the U.S. Uh, took over. It had Saddam's palaces. The U.S. quickly fortified it. There was literally a river slash moat around most of it. Um, and people in there lived in a version of Little America that was a, a physical bubble inside a, a, an intellectual bubble. They rarely experienced any violence. They, they rarely met any Iraqis. They only knew what was going on if people like me told them and they were willing to, to listen to what we had to say to them. But they ate American food. They had a gym and a swimming pool. They went to see first-run American movies. Um, they lived in a dormitory-like setting. That was, I mean, I, I visited uh, multiple times for, for meetings or whatever. It was very comfortable. It was very pleasant. There was soft serve in the cafeteria. It's all free. There was a KFC in like U.S. fast food restaurants there, right? It was, you know, there, no, no, no local food was available. No, no, it was a security issue not to have local food. Um, you know, the idea the Iraqis would 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 poison us or something if we uh, went out and bought uh, hummus from them, and, and so the uh, idea was that uh, inside the the green zone. Everything was imported uh, from outside of Iraq, and they made their own water. 
So that was purified uh, by American machines. Um, and it was that cut off from the reality. But the soft serve ice cream was was wonderful. They had a Caesar salad station uh, in the cafeteria that I still have warm thoughts uh, about. Um, so that was nice that, that Pete lived in a, in a comfortable place. I wouldn't want to see him. Um, and and you so, know. you know, I read this interview with Paul Brinkley from the Pentagon with McKinsey, and he's talking about how when McKinsey came in, it was to kind of mop up after Cheney, where they just simply came in and L. Paul Bremer, Paul Bremer, you know, came in like this imperial lord and tried to privatize everything overnight um, and brought in people who are like Heritage Foundation interns to set up an Iraqi stock market. They debathified and, you know, set the stage for the insurgency there. But then McK uh, McKinsey comes in and the Pentagon starts rethinking, um, I guess, towards the end of the Bush administration and the beginning of the Obama era. And they he basically says that, you know, regarding state owned industry in Iraq, um, we want to get state-owned enterprises up and running and then transitionally privatize. So the goal was always mass privatization. The question was, at what rate? Um, how rapidly do we impose the, the shock doctrine? So maybe you can talk about some of the results that you saw on the ground of you know, dumping money in. And you know, you, I think you said that uh, a gym teacher from the U.S. was with you and she was in charge of women's empowerment. Um, you know, were women empowered? Were was infrastructure built? And you know, is this something that Mayor Pete could actually go out on the campaign trail and talk about with pride? Yeah, well, I, obviously no, we the, know answer the answer is no. And while while when I wrote my book about this and became a federal whistleblower exposing all of this in 2012, this was very controversial. Um, now in 2019, one has to only look at the news of what's going on in Iraq to realize the failure. But that was far from clear in tw in 2012, and and even harder to discern in in, in earlier years. Um, so the people who were doing this, were doing it initially claiming to be unaware of how things were going. They would have had to have been blind, deaf, and dumb, of course, to not realize how terribly all of this was, was failing. It was not hard to figure it out. And there remains, um, I'm always a big believer in the simplest answer is, is likely the correct one. There's a very good chance that the big secret that P Pete Booty Judge is trying to hide is that he participated in this horrendous failure and he doesn't want his name and his reputation as a as a problem solver attached to what was the largest clusterfuck in American foreign policy history. And it could be just as simple uh, as that. But you had to be, like I said, willfully pretending things were not working. Uh, things were working in order to imagine you were accomplishing something. In my sector, for example, we were uh, told to be pouring all sorts of money into a... Uh, a sewage treatment plant. And we did because we were told to, but it was also very obvious that the pumping station above, you know, it, it, water is, it's like a chain. The pumping station, which was sending sewage to our plant wasn't working. And the pumping station that was supposed to take the clean water from our station and send it someplace else wasn't working. And so while our little part of the chain was doing okay, Iraqi people weren't getting any clean water and they weren't getting their sewage processed because the upstream and downstream components weren't working and nobody was telling anybody to put any money into those. Um, our plant was being singled out because it was one of the few that was still semi-government run and there was a giant push to get it converted to local control. I guess that was the, because it was a water plant, I don't think anybody was privatizing it, but the magic word was uh, local control. And so we were fixing something knowing that we were accomplishing nothing. It, I mean, it was literally water not running out of the taps. I mean, it didn't take 
a, 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 a consulting firm to figure out we weren't accomplishing anything. And so my guess is, is at the end of all this, Pete Buttigieg realized he was part of this mess. It started under Bush. It continued under Obama. It was the, 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 the inability to fix anything in Iraq was absolutely a seamless transition between the two uh, administrations. There was no, no real change. The only thing that changed was which group was doing it. And then that's what you were talking about there a moment ago. I mean, if you could imagine this reconstruction process as a series of archaeological layers, um, you know, at the if you dig down deep enough, Paul Bremer had this idea that a bunch of young kids from the Heritage Foundation and, and, and whatever, you know, Republican Party interns were going to, uh, to privatize Iraq over a, over a long weekend. And when that failed, there was this, the next layer above that were these uh, private uh, contracting companies um, like KBR, J Book Dick Cheney's old old buddies. They were going to do it. And then in the layer above that, I think, is the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers who were going to do it. And then the layer above that is the State Department, and we were going to do it. But we all did the same things wrong. And so whether it was a private contractor wasting money because they were putting it in their pockets or a State Department organization wasting money because we had no idea what we were doing and were getting cheated by everyone, in the end of the day, the money was wasted and the Iraqis didn't get anything. And I doubt anybody wants to put their name on that. And Pete Booty Judge, given what he's uh, trying to do for himself here, would be very low on the list of folks who wanted to be associated with any of that or open up these questions or talk about how he was supporting the policy initiative of George Bush or, or any of these kinds of things. I think he wishes it would just all kind of just go away, which is essentially the position of the U.S. government in general. Exactly. And I, that's my theory. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about you know, McKinsey's work with the CIA in a second, but that I really, I, I agree. And I think that really speaks to what kind of, uh, just to, to Booty Judge's character and his mentality, which really contrasts with your own and with that of Tulsi Gabbard, who was also in Iraq um, during the time of the, you know, the Anbar insurgency at one of the worst periods in Iraq. And she came out of it really transformed um, and I think it speaks to this concept that you introduce in your book. We meant, well, the concept of moral injury, what you bring back, the kind of the, the, the wounds you bring back to the U.S. as you continue public service or you continue speaking out about U.S. policy when you're back home. And Buttigieg has clammed up. He's uncritical about this period. And his entire rhetoric is limited to him saying, well, we shouldn't have assault rifles in the U.S. We should just use them to shoot Iraqis over there. I mean, that was basically, and, and in showing a photograph of himself with his service weapon in full battle dress uniform when he was really just a pencil pusher in the seat of an airplane. Uh, whereas Tulsi Gabbard is going out there and, you know, talking about the moral injuries she and so many people uh, she knew in Iraq experienced and using it to inform her understanding of foreign policy as a whole. And it's what you did when you came back. You know, you went on this book tour, you suffered the consequence, the State Department, Hillary's State Department came after you. Um, so, you know, talk about your own experience coming back and, and why, why, what you think this says about Mayor Pete, that he's just continued to go with the establishment and not, you know, and not just just cried from the heart about the horrors that he saw and the corruption and scandals that he saw. This is really interesting. And, and I've been talking about this issue with Iraq for, for years now, seven or eight years. And, and I think this is one of the first truly new things that, that that's come up. So thank you for that. The concept of moral injury may not be familiar to all of your listeners, but the idea is, is that if we are, moral beings. And, and we're not being religious here. We're saying moral beings who have some sense of things that are right and, and, and wrong. Then that moral side of us can be injured the same way you can suffer a physical injury. You can break a bone, but you can also come back from an experience like war with a different understanding of, of, of rights and wrongs and be a different person for having gone on that 
journey of exploration of rights and wrongs. And it's a little different than things like, like PTSD because PTSD is, is in many ways, the physical manifestation of a lot of, 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 difficulties in readjusting from one environment to to another i mean for example in a, in a war zone you react to loud noises because they often mean someone's about to be blown up you fall on the ground or you get underneath something well in civilian life that that tends to make you look like kind of a a, a knucklehead so you learn not to do that and you treat you train yourself as you train yourself to react to loud noises in one way in iraq you train yourself to to do it here and some people People don't snap back. They don't get that. But moral injury runs much deeper, and it changes you at your core as a person. And it doesn't require that you killed babies, and it doesn't require that you saw other people kill babies. It requires that something you did, something you saw, something that you enabled, or something that you simply stood back and allowed to happen touched you morally. And that can include not only acts of violence, but also things like corruption and bribery, um, the spending of money in a way that made vac childhood vaccines too expensive you know, for people uh, to afford. And so their children didn't get vaccinated because you were spending money so freely that the price of everything was going up, uh, things like that. It can include things that damage you morally, whatever you hold as important to you in terms of right and wrong. And it seems nearly close to impossible that Pete Booty Judge could have gone to Iraq both as a consultant uh, and then Afghanistan as a consultant and as a, uh, a uniformed military person, however minor his roles, and not tasted this, not had some sense of it. Because the, the moral incongruities were, were, were written in very large uh, letters all, all around you is as simple as observing the poverty of Iraqis and then feasting on the Caesar salad station. It wasn't hard. And to say that he's come back from this experience sort of, yeah, it was, it was okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it just simply doesn't track. It either means that he's kind of the, the moral equivalent of a psychopath, someone who feels nothing. Who We talk about psychopaths, I mean, like in crime novels and stuff. I mean, you know, bad guys who can harm other people and not feel any remorse. I'm not, I'm not saying he's a psychopath, but it kind of hints at that same mentality that he can see and experience and witness and be witness to events that should jar him morally and especially given how intelligent he is he's got he's a Rhodes scholar he speaks 400 languages whatever he's claiming these, these days you know especially given how intelligent he is that he simply came back and uh, took off his uh, uniform and put on his nice uh, suit and tie and you know okay well that was that moving on um whereas someone like Tulsi who I have great respect for, says, look, th this you can't do this and not think about it, and you can't think about it and not conclude that there are moral issues that, that we need to, to, to sort through. And I have great respect for her being willing to do that, to not just parrot out about, oh, we love the troops and all that good stuff. Um, I, I love the troops too, and I love them enough that I want to see them taken care of and not just told everything will be okay, have a couple of drinks, get some sleep, and you know, you'll be fine. And it's shameful, of course, that we've seen how Tulsi has been treated. Uh, she's a Russian asset, according to Hillary Clinton. She's seems to have to fight her way onto the debate stage and, and to get the attention that, that people like Booty Judge seem to be slathered in. I'd like to hear someone, a uh, reporter or, or a debate uh, person, ask him about his experience in more detail. Not just what he did, though that's important, but how he thought about it, how it affected him, how did it change him, and don't let him get away with some blather about duty, service, honor, country, you know, where you just use a bunch of nice words and everyone cheers. But, but you know, in my case, it, it reawoken conscience in me. Uh, 24 years with the State Department, I prided myself on not having much of a, a conscience, on doing what I was told and not being particularly concerned uh, 
for example, in, during the change of administrations where what I was told today to do was different than what I was told before. Well, we got a new president, so we got a new set of rules, and here's how we're thinking about these things today. Um, I sort of prided myself on being that gray about issues of morality. But what I saw in Iraq changed me. It affected me to the point where I rediscovered my conscience. And as a whistleblower uh, in the in the form of the, this book, We Meant Well, that I wrote, I became a different person and, and, and lost my career, lost my job, almost lost everything, almost went to jail over it. And I'd like to hear Pete Booty Judge explain why that didn't happen to him well, and judge him for that. Well, of course, we know the answer is that, you know, he, he wants to be president and he's running on a centrist platform where not only is he refusing to criticize these wars, but in the last Democratic presidential debate, he and Warren were asked what they would do with the military and whether or not they would expand it, and they both said that they would. So it's 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 pretty clear that he's becoming. I mean, even more than Warren, he's becoming really the kind of uh, even almost neoconservative, or at least this kind of like centrist candidate, where you know he he defends all of these wars and says that you know maybe there were some issues, but they were justified. And and uh, I do want to talk a bit more about. Um, Booty Judge and his role in, in Iraq, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about McKinsey for a second. Um, although there was one thing you said, I, I got to just say this on the record. Um, this this PR thing where Booty Judge pretends to speak multiple languages, I'm com completely calling BS. I've watched some of these videos. As someone, you know, I, I've studied several languages and I, I, I would never, cl he claims to be fluent in six, which is a complete lie. I would never claim to be fluent in, in all of these other languages. But if you watch the videos, what he'll do is he'll speak like one sentence in some language, which is usually a propos of nothing. Like someone will ask him a question about Gaza, and then, and then in, instead of dealing with the issue of, you know, Gazans living in this massive open air prison, he'll just start responding in Arabic and he'll say like a few sentences you learn in a 101 Arabic class. Um, his his language knowledge, I think, is very cursory. But but anyway, aside from that, let's let's get back to uh, McKinsey really quickly. Um, Max kind of alluded to this. I, I want to ask you about if if you know about this about McKinsey's role, um, not just in Iraq but specifically with the CIA. And I I got up a, an article here in the Washington Post. This is from 2015. It's called CIA has paid millions to a consulting firm to help with reorganization. And this became a pretty big scandal within intelligence circles where essentially a lot of people accused, including some government officials, accused McKinsey of squandering many millions of dollars that were paid by the CIA. And it looks pretty dubious, like maybe some people were, you know, in, in a case of p potential corruption, they were just filling each other's pockets. The C and this is from the Washington Post story four years ago. The CIA has paid more than $10 million to a management consulting firm advising senior U.S. intelligence officials on a broad reorganization that agency director John Brennan began earlier this year. And then it's talking about, you know, some of the payments have been viewed with skepticism by some people in Capitol Hill. Several current and former U.S. officials said they were surprised by the magnitude of the consulting contract. What is the rationale when you're talking about millions and millions of dollars? There ought to be a reason why the money is being sent, said one U.S. official familiar with the contract. So I'm wondering if maybe you could provide some more insight into what exactly, I mean, if you know, um, what exactly McKinsey could have been doing with all of these millions of dollars paid to help reorganize the CIA. And it's also just pretty funny because it made me think really quickly of, you might remember in the previous presidential campaign, there was this guy, Evan McMullen, who was the CIA candidate. And, and I thought of this, this tweet that he had from 2016, which was absolutely incredible. One of my, one of my all time favorite CIA tweets, he, he wrote, my role in the CIA was to go out and convince Al Qaeda operatives to instead work with us. <laughs> so, you know, Evan McMullen and, and Booty Judge, I think, are playing on kind of similar demographics in terms of these kind of centrist national security state, um, potentially independents, but also Democrats who, you know, are a little more hawkish than the kind of more prog progressive wing. So there's a few things to respond to there, but I'm wondering if maybe you can just kind of comment on what potentially McKinsey was doing with CIA and, and the, those kinds of circles in Washington. Absolutely. Uh, th this is something that probably I, I'm not 
familiar with that particular study, but I, I am more familiar with some of the, the similar work that McKinsey has done for the State Department over the years. And that one probably got a lot more attention than it was worth, A, because it was a higher dollar figure, but also it's the CIA, so everybody pays more attention than boring State Department or Department of Agriculture. I, I would suspect with a, a little uh, sleuthing around, you could find that McKinsey has done work like that with all sorts of government agencies. And as I said earlier in our, in our discussion, this is not uncommon at all. I mean, the expression Beltway Bandit uh, is not uh, an accidental one. There are these companies that live off of government uh, contracts like this. And they're brought in uh, as a quote-unquote neutral outsider um, either to try to answer a problem that is too hot for bureaucrats to want to attach their names to or to spend a whole bunch of time pretending to analyze something and then so they can endorse what management has wanted all along. And management can say, well, it's not our idea, it's, it's McKinsey's idea. Um, in the case of the, the State Department, the one study that I was uh, tangentially involved in had to do with uh, our evolving workforce. Um, we had... Uh, we had started. We had started to take in uh, a more diverse uh, workforce of entry-level uh, diplomats. I mean, diverse in, in not only in the traditional ways in terms of uh, race and, and religion and what have you, but also um, in terms of background, experience, age fill in the blank, all, all this, and we were managing it very poorly. We didn't really know how to interact with these people. And rather than actually try to fix the problem, the State Department paid McKinsey to come in and conduct a whole bunch of interviews and write a whole long report that, that really didn't amount to much of anything. I mean, the best parts of it were sort of common sense, like talk to each other more. Um, and the worst of it was silliness about creating new training programs about diversity that were all, that were going to become mandatory. And we're, of course, McKinsey was going to be developing those programs for us at, at great cost. So there's an awful lot of this. And, and I, I hate to, to not be able to kind of fan any conspiracy flames for you, but most of it is, is nefarious only in the sense that it's extraordinary wastes of money. Um, they're not trying to accomplish much of anything. Somebody wants to say, hey, there was this problem under my watch and I commissioned a study. If the next guy doesn't fix it, it's his fault, not mine. Um, or we've always wanted to reorganize along the following lines. The rank and file won't accept it. So we're going to hire a contractor to come in and tell us it's the best way to do it. And then everyone will have to accept it. So an awful lot of that kind of thing gets done. It accomplishes nothing. It just turns things around. And these consultant firms charge extraordinary amounts of, of, of money to do this. They are able to, it's like a law firm, you know, how a, a, if, if, any, if you've ever had to pay legal fees, lawyers charge you by the, 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 the hour and they're allowed to, it's in the contract you sign, they're, they're allowed to consider anything over a certain number of minutes, an hour. I'm just going to make one up and say anything over 42 minutes is an hour. So the idea would be that they could be paid by you for one hour of their work uh, for 42 minutes, and then they can be using the next, uh, the other 18 minutes of that hour to work for someone else, and they can be paid double for that period of time. And that's that's how their business works. And, and so these consulting companies do the same thing. They're they're paying one of their own employees $65 an hour to. Uh, conduct interviews, but they're billing the U.S. government $265 an hour for blah, 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 overhead, blah, 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 blah. Um, certainly, once you get travel involved, these folks uh, do not travel. Uh, they don't stay at the U.S. government rate motel, no-tells, and they don't travel in super saver economy class. They tend to travel in business class and stay at better facilities. Um, and they tend to have things in their contracts that say you, you, should, you don't have to take the red eye and arrive at the airport an hour before the meeting. Come in the night before. That's how uh, these things work. And so they, they are able to charge enormous amounts of money for very, very basic stuff. Like I said, oftentimes the, the, the highlights of their work are, are common sense. Um, they also do 
and this has nothing to do with Booty Judge, but they also do, for example, a lot of technical consulting on computer systems and things like that, where they can charge even more money um, because the work is probably being done at their uh, center in, in uh, India and they're billing it at New York City rates because the, uh, the office they're working for is in New York. So it's a very, very lucrative way to do business. And parenthetically, going back to Pete Booty Judge, I mean, it may also be that, again, he just doesn't want to associate his name and the image and the narrative he's telling with you know people like this. So there's a lot of suggestions that he just doesn't want this to be there. He wishes it wasn't even something that happened, but he's going to try to see if the media, which so far, of course, has been so kind to him, um, will just take the hint and stop asking him. Right. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my problem with um, McKinsey is not that they've been involved with the CIA and that Mayor Pete might still be an active CIA asset, which is the kind of conspiracy theory going around. And, you know, who knows? There may be some conspiracy facts there. I can't prove it. But what I do know is that, you know, I have a big problem with what McKinsey does in the open, and that should be the issue. I did a piece uh, back in 2014. I just kind of finished covering Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip, had been there, had seen them just destroy, you know, not entire cities in this kind of medieval fashion. And then, you know, John Kerry comes in at an international donors conference in Egypt with the kind of international janitorial crew and realizes, well, nobody really wants to donate this time because Israel keeps blowing up all of their projects. So he brings in McKinsey after proposing this $4 billion reconstruction plan. And McKinsey produces this bizarre document uh, for you know, rebuilding the Gaza and the West, Ga the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, um, which had been circulated among Palestinian businessmen, so I, it was leaked to me, um, that addresses these areas as if they were just normal places that could be transformed into Singapore or Dubai overnight. And so, you know, in McKinsey's document, they referred to Gaza as a place that underperforms on key tourism metrics, without mentioning <laughs> occupation. <laughs> Siege, Israel dropping hundreds of thousands of pounds of explosives on it every few years. Uh, they refer to, you know, low awareness of existing tourism destination sites in Gaza as something that affects tourism metrics and proposes a range of new hotel offerings underpinned by aggressive marketing. Now, me or you, I, I had to get into Gaza with a, you know, the permission of the Israeli government as a journalist, but most people just can't go. So McKinsey didn't mention that. It just showed the complete ignorance of their staff. And then in the end, they, they propose um, creating sweatshops in Gaza that produce buttons for high-end Israeli uh, designers. So basically maintaining and actually exploiting the status quo of occupation to benefit hipsters in Tel Aviv who maybe can make like, you know, um, vegan buttons for like vegetarian Israeli soldiers to go in in their fruit leather boots and stomp on the heads of babies in Gaza or something. So, uh, yeah, I want to touch on, on your use of the word naive there because be careful. It depends on which, which direction you're looking. You know, McKinsey could care less about the in this case the Palestinians or Pal or, you know or anything like that. What McKinsey cares about is that John Kerry signs the checks for them, and exactly. so they are going to produce for him a report which says what he wants it to say, which is basically we can fix this. Most of the problems are the Palestinians' faults because they're underperforming metrics or whatever, um, and that's the kind of thing that McKinsey and other consultants. I mean. Seriously, I can't tell you one of them that, that isn't that way. That's how they work. And back to Booty Judge, there's an excellent, excellent chance that there's paper out there with his name on it that says stupid things like that about Iraq. <laughs> And because tourism was one of the areas that was going to be uh, a big, big boom for Iraq, by the way. Um, and so there's a very good chance there's a report where Pete Booty Judge, you know, talks about how the Iraqis have undermarketed themselves uh, during the Saddam years and that uh, there's a big interest in uh, tourism that is untapped, blah, blah, blah. And he's just embarrassed to have to answer to this stuff. I mean, especially in the way that things work in modern times where literally anything you've ever written in your entire life is subject to, uh, you know, 
mockery on on social media right. i'm sure that has a lot to do the question is i think bringing it all home and and this goes back to the language issue as well you had mentioned and i agree with you that he's full of it he doesn't speak these languages he knows he knows a few words that like that tourists pick up when they're traveling you know or or you remember from your your class your spanish class in high school or something actually being fluent in a foreign language is extraordinarily difficult i lived in japan for 10 years um including two years as a student and and i would be hesitant unless I'm trying to show off to claim I'm, I'm fluent. Um, and so all these folks who walk around claiming multiple fluencies, what, what it tells us though, forget about that. Everybody brags about foreign language skills or whatever. Um, it tells us something about the, the, the man himself. And that's something that voters have to judge because we all know that who, whatever president, whatever candidates promise, the day they become president, the world starts changing and things start happening. We have to elect a person that can handle that. And if this guy is willing to make up tall tales about his, his skill set, if he wants to pretend some things he did didn't happen, if he wants to take us as stupid enough to believe that a non-disclosure agreement prevents him from even mentioning anything he had to do with this, and at the same time claim credit for government experience and service in a war zone, I mean, if he really thinks we, the voters, are that gullible, then that tells us something about him as a person that maybe we should take into account as we make a decision on which candidate to support. Yeah, well, we're going to wrap up in a moment here, but I will say that while you mentioned how in presidential ca um, campaigns, anything that a candidate has ever written is, is fair game. So I actually want to I want to quote uh, Booty Judge when he was in, in 2000, when he was still in high school. And I'll say that Booty Judge should take his own. Uh, his own advice from back when he was in high school, and this is an, an this is an award-winning essay that he wrote when he was at Saint Joseph's High School in Indiana, and the the essay is titled "Bernie Sanders," <laughs> and he wrote this great homage to Bernie Sanders on on how Bernie was so courageous. Uh, Sanders' courage is evident in the first word he uses to describe himself: socialist. While impressive, Sanders' candor doesn't, does not itself represent political courage. The nation is teeming with outspoken radicals. Um, it's the second half of Sanders' political courage that puts the first half into perspective. He is a powerful force for conciliation and bipartisanship on Capitol Hill. Sanders' positions on many difficult issues are commendable. Uh, so, Booty Judge should go back to, uh, to listen to what he wrote when he was in high school. <laughs> and, uh, but here, here's, I think Max is going to wrap up here. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, just in closing, Peter, I think uh, our uh, viewers and listeners would be really interested in knowing a little bit more about, the. I think, what I would call the persecution you've experienced since you became a whistleblower. Um, first, kind of being targeted by the State Department under Hillary, um, and you were in 2018 booted off Twitter. Um, I couldn't really figure out why. Uh, but we've seen um, a number of people just kicked off Twitter. Uh, Daniel McAdams was kicked off uh, from the Ron Paul Institute for calling Sean Hannity a retard, um, which, you know, may be an insult to, um, you know, many people. But uh, I'm sure that someone who's like a multimillionaire like Sean Hannity wasn't very threatened by that. So it seems like there's been, you know, political targeting. Um, tell us, you know, if you can tell us a little more about, about that, that would be really interesting. Sure. The, the, with the State Department, when uh, it, it became, they became aware that my book was coming out and I had gone through channels, I had done all of the, uh, the things you're supposed to do. They uh, unleashed uh, everything uh, against me. They initially tried, they falsely claimed I had included classified material. We pushed that back. They falsely claimed that I uh, had done some things at work that were not work related we pushed back against that they eventually just basically said we just don't like you doing this and we can't we failed to prosecute you um we're going to fire you because you're not cooperating in the investigation to fire you 
was basically the wrap-up ex excuse. Um, this went on for almost a, a year. I was sent home. I was not allowed to, 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 to work. I was given make-work projects. I was harassed by the security team who was desperately digging through my life, monitoring my private emails, hoping they could come up with something. I live a boring life. They, they couldn't. Um, in the end, thanks to some excellent lawyers, a woman named Jessalyn Raddick, who went on to represent Chelsea Manning and Ed Snowden, um, she worked with me, the ACLU worked with me, and I was able to quote unquote retire from the State Department, which is, you know, under the circumstances, probably the best kind of ending you can expect in, in things like that. Um, I've not grown quieter as I've grown older. And uh, about uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago on Twitter, I was uh, aggressively engaging with a number of, of journalists. Um, basically Who accusing, I think we run up against them a lot. We're all middle Eastern specialists. I can't remember their names, but if you go to my website, so -called uh, specialists, yeah, if you go to my website, we meant well.com and search under Twitter, it, it should all come up. Um, I didn't even know a lot of them. Some of them I knew, or some of them I knew by their work, but I basically was accusing them of simply writing down what government officials told them, um, of refusing to ask hard questions, in many cases not being prepared or educated enough to know what the hard questions were. And I used myself as an example that throughout my time in Iraq, I lied to them. I gave them inaccurate, incomplete, misleading information, and no one challenged me. It wasn't particularly difficult to do. Um, and I have no respect for them. And they kind of did that Twitter hive mind thing where I guess they were, they got all their, their friends to, to claim that I was harassing them. And then finally, uh, this was on a Sunday night. I was actually watching, uh, forgive me. It's a, it's a, it's a flaw in me. I was watching the walking dead on TV. <laughs> There's something and, wrong with that. <laughs> and I said, I said to one of reply to one of these guys, I said, I hope a, a, a MAGA, you know, make America great again, zombie bites your face off or something like that. Um, and he oh, and reported they said that it, was like a, th a death threat or something. In yeah, he thing. reported it to Twitter as a, as a death threat. And Twitter at that moment uh, banned me forever. Um, no appeals, no questions. If uh, I later was able to recover uh, most of the tweets, and if you go to um, my blog, you can read them there. Um, there's an article about it on the American Conservative where I do some writing. Um, but basically, it was to shut me up. It was, you know, you're 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 pecking a little too close to the bone here, reminding people that journalists. Uh, mainstream journalists, I should say, I should be careful, that mainstream journalists often are just stenographers for the government. Um, some of them are dumb, ignorant, unwilling, you know, stenographers, and some of them, uh, like the people who often write for the Washington Post or the New York Times, are extremely intelligent, informed people who still willfully write garbage uh, in service to other people, other corporations, and other ideals um, beyond simply telling the truth. And whether they do it as an in intelligent, informed person or whether they do it because they're stupid and they're just writing down what they're told, it doesn't matter. The same garbage gets shoveled out to the public. And I was calling these people out by name, um, and that cannot stand on Twitter. Yeah, I, I'm looking through these tweets and you know, I'm noticing many of these are people who are targeting us uh, actually, you know, to try to actually get us disappeared, not just from Twitter, but get us disappeared from uh, the entire Internet and uh, and worse. Um, and, you know, you're saying that you hope a MAGA guy eats your face. It sounds kind of uh, absurd and you're it's not really a, it's not a direct threat. Um, so I don't know. See, I get that all the time. People hope bad things happen to me, but I don't report them because it's like, you know, you're, they're not directly threatening me. I also get direct threats as well. Um, but it always seems that the other side, the side that seems to be kind of promoting these wars behind their Middle East specialty, their supposed specialty, which they never seem to have or can back up or, uh, you know, behind being uh, on the left, um, that they engage in these coordinated 
targeting campaigns and your voice was disappeared from a platform um, at a time when the platform is really, you know, and Sil Silicon Valley in general is kind of merging with the national security state. So I always, I see this happen and I always wonder who's next. And, you know, we'll be talking more in the future about some of the campaigns that are targeting us. Um, but, you know, it was good to get you on to, to tell people about the kind of McCarthyite atmosphere we're, we're, uh, we're living in, I think you, you're, you said, uh, criticize a journalist and see what happens. They do this so sooner or later, the only people on their timeline are those who agree with them. And that's what they want. They want a complete and total control over all information space. Uh, and they are the true authoritarians while they claim that they want to promote democracy abroad. I agree completely. Well, you know, thanks a lot for, for taking the time to join us. Um, you know, the, your, your book is still incredibly relevant. Um, as this conversation shows, we meant well, uh, which is, uh, was came out, I think in 2011, um, how I helped lose the battle for the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people it was published in 2012. Um, we meant well by Peter Van Buren and, um, your novel Hooper's war also deserves consideration. Um, Ben, you want to tell people how they can support us? Absolutely. So you are listening to and perhaps watching Moderate Rebels. If you want to support this show, please consider being a sustainer, a patron at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And also you can go to find uh, Peter's blog, go to wemeantwell.com and he has a bunch of really good blog posts. He has some insightful analysis. So you should definitely check out his work there. Once again, Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening, and we're out.